with the psychedelics, it's not a matter of high frequency, I think. The good trips are usually good for plenty of rumination for a long time. The harder the hit, the longer you want to ponder it before you go that route again. Uh, it isn't like a practice. It isn't like something you do daily. It's more like a, a uh, unique act of courage that arises out of the of the substratum of ordinary daily existence, whether it be uh, profane or or sacral. There really isn't an answer to your question as long as we're part of the worker anthill or living in a society which makes tremendous demands on us. Uh, it's going to be a problem. Uh, the way to take psychedelics is uh, you must have seen these t-shirts which say I take drugs seriously well that's the way to take them which means rarely and at, and at substantially challenging doses <laughs> and in an atmosphere where there are no distractions and by that I mean, other people will say something different, but I mean no light and no sound, including music, unless you're a musician or you have some special relationship to music. But really, what you're trying to see is the, um, the, the, the surface of the brain-mind interface. And to the degree that you can create a situation of sensory deprivation, you will have a greater expectation of succeeding. Some people wouldn't dream of tripping without music, but I find that you know it becomes the trip. The whole thing then becomes about that piece of music where in silence it would have been equally audially interesting. So it isn't... The, the early model of the psychedelic experience was sort of that you uh, eat an orange and look at art books and listen to Bach's choral preludes but that art historical approach to it doesn't give enough credit to the power of the substance I mean it can lift veil after veil in silent darkness to just catapult you into endlessly undulating uh, uh, tapestries of organic beauty and there need be no sensory input in fact shouldn't be for this to happen you had a question <coughs> I was wondering about practical sort of so yeah it seems like how do you take something back it's sort of like going to a magic kingdom and wanting to take back a gold golden piece with you or a key or, or something because I, I lose it you know and I well I think I sort of touched on this obliquely tonight that attention to attention or paying attention to the nuances of cognition is a psychedelic way of being. I mean, if any of you are familiar with uh, Marcel Proust's uh, Recherche du Temps Perdu, he didn't take drugs except for laudanum and valerian and alcohol and absinthe and tobacco and uh, things like that. So he was drug free and he. <coughs> he. Uh, he managed to refine, you know, this art of just the awareness of the tensions and nuances in the moment. For really, what I have come to believe about the psychedelic experience is that it is simply a compressed instance of what we call understanding. So that uh, living psychedelically is trying to live in an atmosphere of continuous unfolding of understanding so that every day you know more and see into things with greater depth than you did before and this is a process it's a process of education what the psychedelic experience is is it's the process of education so compressed that it has become a cascade of actual visual images which uh, rather than a kind of slow unfoldment of linked perceptions but really 
attention to attention and appreciation of the immediate. I always think when this comes up of William Blake's advice. Blake was, as you know, a great mystical visionary English poet who spoke with angels and had these wonderful visions of the of uh, the angelic world and he was asked what was the secret of his angelic poetry and he said attend the minute particulars that's all just attend the minute particulars that the and what he meant was to focus attention in the moment not to not to betray attention into expectation born of abstraction or regret born of misplaced assumption or of remembrance born of boredom and alienation in the moment but just to attend the minute particulars it's a way of training it's like yoga people think that psychedelic uh, psychedelics are somehow the easy way out this is what people think who wouldn't dare dream of taking one and it's not because it's the easy way out. It's because they sense the, the reality of it, the reality of the fact of it, and the challenge of assimilating it. I mean, uh, it's very real. It's not a metaphor. It's not an analogy. It's not a dramatic reconstruction. It is not a simulacrum. It is not a model. It is the pith essence of the thing itself it's uh, it's real and I don't know how many things can make that claim I mean everyone has a different set of experiences my own experiences have uh, of the other of the transcendent naked beauty of truth have almost all entirely come out of the psychedelic realm or out of involvement with the viscerality of my emotions you know the death of my mother the birth of my children uh, the act of marrying someone uh, not uh, not else but those so I think it's uh, it's about attending the minute particulars as a kind of practice it may not get you anywhere for several years but if you attend the minute particulars, cultivate uh, an ongoing stream of self-description, telling yourself what is happening, get used to the idea that mind can penetrate the immediate surface of being and reveal the tactile density of it as a manifold whose measure cannot be immediately taken by the eyes that it's deep it's connected it's complex everything holds within itself the anticipation and the memory of everything else yes I just want to feel so optimistic well it's hard to feel optimistic sometimes it's uh, but it's an almost like an obligation and I think there's enough evidence around to support it um, if Ronald Reagan is going to begin the process of the dismantling of strategic nuclear stockpiles then you know what would a civilized and humane political leader be doing in this context so on one level I'm fairly cynical I see you know uh, people whose major life's work has been banditry and bloody rampage getting into the history books as uh, great peacemakers nevertheless I love the fact that the constraints of the situation have forced these clowns into this position that's what I mean when I say you know that no political group no faction has its hands on the tiller of history there is uh, an invisible hand which seems to be channeling the life of these institutions toward uh, what 
we deem progressive ends and uh, not not because these people have converted to altruism and reason and sweetness and light but because it's a way for them to save their political ass so it has become expedient peace has become politically expedient consequently we shall have it I think in a big hurry now granted it doesn't address starvation sexism uh, abuses of propaganda torture uh, all, all of these things but I, I feel like that there is a kind of a log jam in human affairs that formed in the late 60s where we all looked over into the future and saw what it was and the governing agencies froze with terror and attempted to halt the onrushing momentum of the 20th century to not only make psychedelic drugs illegal for the public but to actually end scientific research into them this is phenomenal scientific research is supposed to be freely pursued in any field that's the banner under which science rides its horse but uh, apparently this doesn't apply to hallucinogens uh, freezing all dialogue on disarmament freezing all dialogue on the retraction of imperial the projection globally of imperial power and uh, strategic stockpiles all this was frozen in place in the late 60s and it's only now beginning to give way the future has a momentum that no institution can deny and the uh, 25 years of constipated dithering that we have just come through has only meant that now the transition into the new order will be that much more sudden and that much more complete um, so I guess I am uh, I am optimistic in uh, and, and the micro I see many causes for pessimism but generally I think things globally are working out fine now it may be and I address this tonight in the talk a little bit it may be that a sane humane and well-fed uh, world is coming into being but it may not be led by the United States of America we muscle bound with strategic arsenals unable to produce things which the rest of the world wants to buy entertaining a massive trade deficit tolerant of uh, reactionary pseudo religious forms of political crypto fascism we are uh, did, uh, I hope no one's offended by that we uh, are not exactly in the best position to uh, to lead the charge into this great and glorious future a society with a tradition of resource management like Japan is perhaps in a much better position although then there are other problems Japan speaks a language no one understands it's going to be quite a world if the power of the projection of the Japanese cultural self-image is to become so overwhelming that Japanese is to become the dominant language of the West although this is a possibility certainly if any of you are familiar with the fiction of William Gibson uh, and if you're not I urge it upon you this is some of the most exciting science fiction being written he pictures a world where Japanese cultural dominance I would say is a, a primary factor so yes I'm optimistic uh, we have to be it's the only game in town and look at the opportunities it's simply a matter of insisting on human values garnered from the felt experience of the moment and holding back the toxic effects of ideology in other words this anarchic prescription that I sort of put forth this evening mainly holding back the toxic effects of ideology 
because then we can create a sane world if we just uh, recognize that pragmatism, love for each other, and a reasonable amount of goodwill uh, will do quite nicely, I think, if the shriller voices, the ideologically driven voices, can be uh, made uh, déclassé, not repressed, just simply recognized as tasteless. You know. Anything else? Yes. Could you just uh, reflect on uh, what culture will be like after the end of time? Uh, and uh, what, what the end of time has to do with what you said tonight? What kind of time? Yeah, the different kinds of time? or Well, yeah, I've certainly I've reflected on what it's like. It's sort of a blank screen on which to project your mind. What will it be like once we pass the omega point? I'm not really sure. I mean, there, it you can take two approaches to it. You can take the sort of the deus ex machina approach, which means we can't know what it is because it's going to be so wonderful. It's going to be like uh, uh, the descent of the flying saucers and we will all march into the four-gated city and that will be it. Or you can take a more conservative approach and say well maybe there's something going on in the trends around us that we can extrapolate to try and understand the world beyond the end of time taking that approach what I think is happening and it's been happening for a long time and it's very interesting is that culture culture is another dimension that uh and perhaps properly so. In the early part of my talk, I talked about how culture had uh, subsumed the position of nature so that we had lost sight of nature by erecting culture through uh, erecting these linguistic structures. But I noticed that, uh, and not only linguistic structures, but architectural structures, the infrastructure, of our society that is what culture is the way we differ from the we toto is all the stuff that we have bound into ideas and excreted through our engineering processes to surround ourselves with uh, this this dimension which is culture is becoming ever more it all inclusive at the same time that it's also becoming strangely enough ever more ethereal ever less material uh, a perfect example of this I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with it but if you deal with the Macintosh computer the operating system of the Mac is the genius of it and what makes it the best in the biz is that it attempts to trick you into believing that you're dealing with ordinary three-dimensional space. You know, you don't type in commands, you don't choose printed options, you move in a symbolic representation of three-dimensional space. Well, again, to mention William Gibson and his novels, what he imagines is simply a larger version of this conventionalized uh, symbolic representation of three-dimensional space so that you enter in his novels, his characters enter into a world where the Bank of America database is perceived as a huge red rectangle hundreds of feet in height in a certain spot in the memory of this global computer and, and near, yes, it's cyberspace and near it is the memory bank of Wells Fargo or something else so that when you enter into cyberspace ordinary reality is replaced by a symbolic representation of the informational content of ordinary reality well this is in fact happening uh, it's happening at a very rapid rate so the dimension which we call culture which we have previously uh, erected in the three-dimensional world around us through the intercession of what we call manufacturing and architecture 
is very rapidly being internalized and erected as cyberspace this alternative dimension to ordinary three-dimensional space in which our minds are able to move like fish in water. What I think lies beyond uh, the end of time is a very concrete realization of this other dimension. That's why things like the time wave that I've developed and some of these other projections run off the scale the world beyond the end of history is literally not mappable in the lower order set of mapping that are applicable to history. So it is like being downloaded into circuitry. Uh, it's possible to conceive of the entire human species fitting into uh, the area of a large uh, refrigerator in in cyberspace so that the goal of history is the creation of a mirror image of culture in the cyberspatial dimension so that culture in the dimension of nature can be slowly retracted slowly retracted into the compressed quintessence you can almost think of this as an alchemical process. We're talking about forging a philosopher's stone out of a hyperdimensional medium which is composed of energy and language and into which we can all cast ourselves at will. It is, you know, Plato said if God didn't exist, man would invent him, her, it. Well, it may well be that uh, the pilot's seat, the pilot's chair of the flying saucer is empty. It awaits mankind. It is the condensed expectation of complete interpenetration of all of us through each other and our cultural artifact in a mode that we cannot even imagine at an earlier talk at Will's here a couple of years ago I did a talk called Shedding the Monkey in which I talked about dropping uh, the primate image that is projected onto the human soul through, through the accidents of biological evolution that as we take control of our genetic heritage as we take control of the process of manufacturing culture, we are going to become what we dream we are. And we have never really explored consciously what it is we dream we are. But very shortly, this will become a major part of the cultural agenda because we are going to be able to do anything. And... Uh, with that kind of power, again recurring to the theme of the evening, I think we have to anchor ourselves in nature. So sort of my apothe uh, apotheosis or my vision of, of how this should come to be is that everyone is given uh, you know, their own 500 acres of paradise in the chip. <laughs> and that is your heritage, your space, your right place to be. And out of the mellowness which accrues only to the very wealthy, which we will then, each and every one of us, fall into that category, we will be able to return to the dimension of the limited pie and very decorously and thoughtfully apportion it out in a sane and rational matter. So, manner. So, uh, and it's very, very tricky, see, this rush toward the ability to completely realize the self-image in hyperspace. My mother used to say to me when I was a small child, if wishes were horses, beggars would ride. And I think that that's the dream to turn wishes into horses that beggars may ride and it's that world 
where we each get our own horse or when our ship comes in that lies uh, beyond the historical dimension because it's where we in effect each becomes all and then is freed into the imagination of the oversoul to create whatever castles in the imagination seem most pleasing it's the triumph of art art in the imagination and reverence for nature in the uh, in the placental dimension which is the life support system for this fantastic indulgence in the uh, in the uh, expression of the imagination yeah about, uh, culture and uh Plasticity of ideology. I'm, I'm an educator. I educate young children, and I just like you to address what we can do, uh, or what your idea is about what uh, society can do, so that we don't have to undo it at some point. I mean, any, most of us here have to kind of undo what we went through as children in public education, anyway. Um, so that we, we could at least come to some level of awareness or uh, peacefulness within ourselves. What is the positive side of it? What is your... Uh, uh well, in Hawaii this past year, we homeschooled our children, and we also coincidentally rented office space from a major company which creates homeschooling curriculums. And on their letterhead, they had the motto you are your child's best teacher and uh, we found out how hard it is to live up to that ideal and yet in a way we also found out how rewarding it was to attempt it uh, when we return to Northern California our children will go to public school uh, I think basically y you have to just you have to not leave it up to the school you have to check in on what's going on and uh, input into the process I don't I don't feel that I can give a very deep answer to this I think it's one of the most perplexing problems one thing I think that's terribly wrong with education is that there is no sense of history instilled in people and uh, history has almost as bad a rap on it as mathematics and yet these are the two modes of thought which I think would do the most to anchor us because they both are about uh, different forms of grounding one grounds in eternal demonstrable principles mathematics and the other uh, dissipates amnesia it's a very weird thing that somebody can't tell you isn't quite clear on whether event X happened in the 13th or the 16th century I mean after all 13th, 16th, 19th how would you like to be uh, you know so imprecisely perceived in somebody's mind that they couldn't get within 300 years of where you lived and died uh, so the lack of a sense of history makes us really prey to manipulation that's why I, I am cynical enough to believe that the de-emphasizing of history that's gone on in American education over the past 30 years is almost the equivalent of a plot the notion you know even as recently as when I graduated from the university and it took me 12 years so I didn't graduate until 75 but the idea was that if you went to a university you emerged uh, a, a liberal gentle person in well informed on the accomplishments of your culture its history its aspirations its ways of governing itself its ways of resolving conflict and so on now I think people emerge these things have become gigantic trade schools and you are not you are expected to learn to do a job and when not doing your job 
malls have been provided for you to shop in, and uh, tele- 240 channels of garbage have been piped into your home for you to keep up on what it is that is all Quran to go out and buy. And this creation of this historyless, uh, mindless, consumerist person at the expense of the democratic, of the ideal of the democratically informed citizen is going to wreak great havoc in our society. Uh, people often compliment me on, you know, the, my enchanting command of these various subjects and so forth and so on. And I'm amazed because what's being sold to you here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing more than the fruits of a liberal college education. You know, you go to college, you learn about Gnosticism, Platonic philosophy, or you once did, but no more, apparently. So it can be sold as the most far out, fringy thing in the new age. This is, this is, his, this is amnesia on, on quite a scale. So, uh, and the other thing I would say in answer to your question about education is, uh, is uh, separating physical culture from competition. That the notion of physical culture, and by that I mean gym class, and competition is one of the, I mean, I, I'm, now I feel the bile rising. This is, uh, we're talking serious here now. But saving people from the grief of PE is, I think, a, a major way to heal the culture. When, when we were living in Hawaii, Cat uh, asked our son, how did he think of himself? And he said he thought of himself as, an artist and an athlete and I thought that this was just an amazing breakthrough because I thought of myself as uh, uh, you know a sort of 95 pound weakling and uh, the notion that my son could be physically just like I was at his age and yet conceive of himself as an athlete and have this balanced view of art athlete, uh, junior scientist, and so forth, meant we must be doing something right. And what it is, is stressing physical culture, being in the ocean, hiking, running, skateboarding, biking, all these things, without the notion of males crashing against each other for the purposes of racking up points with females and elders to lay the groundwork for the whole imposition of the alpha male primate hierarchy that makes society such a mess. So that's that for education. Maybe one more question if there is one. Yes. You mentioned the from the Amazon that has the power to reveal a lot of different layers in your speech. Did you mention? I think I must have mentioned ayahuasca. Well, I'll briefly mention it again. If any of you are interested in ayahuasca, the standard reference work is, uh, that's in print is called Hallucinogens and Shamanism, edited by Michael Harner. There are, I think, about three articles in there on ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a combinatory preparation, a beverage made by boiling down the bark of a jungle liana which contains harmine and other monoamine oxidase inhibiting compounds and adding uh, DMT which occurs in Socotria viridis a a plant related to coffee and uh, and it's generally by the people there viewed as a tonic, a purgative something which keeps the society in equilibrium also been written about by Marlene Dobson de Rios and others and uh, I understand there are uh, there are therapists in the Bay Area working uh, very quietly to uh, create an awareness of its potential impact on psychotherapy which we can personally 
uh, attest that it has a great potential. We saw uh, physical symptoms relieved in the Amazon. We saw uh, neurotic behavior, uh, neurotic behavior patterns dissolve, and it's just one of many shamanic uh, devices, plant hallucinogens that have not been studied by medical science and will not be studied as long as the current hysteria about psychedelic drug research represses the scientific community from having anything to do with these things. Nevertheless, you know, it's uh, it's history as a curing agent among these tribes goes back uh, at, to at least pre-conquest times and it has a reputation for inducing states of group mindedness which approach the level of being uh, almost uh, telepathic so it's being used in the Amazon to regulate social processes as well as uh, the health of individuals so it's very very interesting in the way that it seems to be a, a kind of pristine model of the many ways that a psychedelic compound can have a, a, a healing effect in a society. Well, I think that's about it for this evening. It's 10.30. Thanks. I want to thank you all very much. It's good to be back.